Chess Fest Academy number 11, where we take a look at some tricky things, draws and stalemates. This is a great little setup we have right here. So take a moment, pause the video, and set up the pieces on these squares on a board in front of you so you can play along and see what is happening here. This will give us a lot of information about draws and stalemates. Now we've covered check and checkmate. Check when you attack your opponent's king and they have to then get out of check and if they can't then you're looking at checkmate. Shamat, the king is dead, the game is over. Now in this case with a draw, a draw is like a tie. So we said if white wins you would write the score as 1-0, one point for white, zero for black. If black wins you write the score as 0-1, one point for black. White losing gets nothing. In a draw, you actually write it as one half dash one half. And those little half points can be the difference in a tournament between uh, placing in the tournament or winning or a team win can sometimes be uh, garnered by that half point. So a draw is actually a very important part of the game in our World Chess Championship between uh, Anand and Carlson. Most of the games were draws. Uh, draws are very common in all sorts of chess. They're not to be avoided, and we'll come back to that. But if you look at this setup here, this is very interesting. This is a game between Alexander Belyovsky and Larry Christensen. The last move, White had just taken, I'm sorry, Black, Black had just taken his rook from A2 and slid along that second rank to H2 to put the White King in check. Now, before we even look at that, take a moment and look at uh, Black's king. He's under a lot of pressure here, to say the least. Um, the king has no safe square he can move to. The rook and the queen are keeping that seventh rank uh, off limits to him. He has no way of blocking so that he might be able to get the king to a safe place. Uh, and g5 is double uh, attacked and by uh, white's pawn and queen. And so you see that white has a uh, mate coming up, his checkmate coming up. Uh, queen h8 is mate. But it's not white's move when black slides that look rook along the second uh, rank to h2. So black knows he's about to go down. He has no escape here either. He has no way of preventing this checkmate. So this is white's game. This, this game is pretty well over. Now, in a tournament, if you can get a draw instead of a loss, well, that's a good thing. Again, that half point might be the difference you need. Um, in friendly play, though, I want to emphasize, if you're just playing a friend um, and you are way down and you're in a losing position, uh, the gentlemanly thing, the ladylike thing to do is to resign and to move on and start a new game, unless you see something absolutely brilliant like this. One thing you should never do in chess is push for a stalemate or a draw in a friendly game. A friendly game should be friendly. So for example, I, I've actually seen young players, one of them is down to say just a king or a king and a knight, insufficient mating material, and is playing against an opponent who is well-armed, still has queen, both rooks, and a bishop, and several pawns, that game should not be continuing. If you are down to just about nothing and you are getting creamed, probably 10 moves earlier, you should have said, ah, I'm not going to pull this one through and you resign. In other sports and other games, quitting is looked down upon. It's a bad thing. It's the opposite in chess. In chess, if you are in a losing position, if you are in a losing game, trying to battle it out for a stalemate or a draw is bad manners. The right thing to do is you just resign, and that's fine. It's not quitting and losing and, and all this horrible stuff. You say, ah, all right, I'm going to resign. You gently don't slam it down. You just tip your king as a symbol of that and move on and play another game, either with that same person or somebody else that you might be better matched with. So... Uh, at this point, black is about to lose. 
And so he sees something ingenious here. This is wonderful. The, the rook h2 move puts the white king in check, directly under attack. And if you look at it, there are three ways to get a check. Remember, you can move, block, or capture. He certainly can't block because the checking piece is on the next square. Um, he can't move the king, but he can capture. And you might think that's a horrible thing for black, but it actually isn't. Because a uh, white member has to get out of check. He can't just ignore this check and go for his mate. Now it's white's turn, and he's in check. He has to take that rook. He has absolutely no choice. And so with kx h2, what would happen then is now um, it is black's move. Black wants to, strangely enough, he knows he can't win this game. And so what he wants to actually do is something like rook g2, check, and give away that other rook which, again, counterintuitive. It goes against the normal thinking. So rook g2 check, white realizes, oh, if I take that rook with kx g2 for white, it is now black's move. And if you look at this board, black has no legal moves. Three of his pawns are butting up against White's pawns and can't advance, can't capture. He actually can't move this pawn on g6 because if he does make the move g5, he'd be putting himself in check. It's an illegal move, remember? Uh-uh-uh, can't do that. I have to put it back and do something else. He can't play g6, and we already covered that he can't move his king. The three squares available to the king are all attacked by White's pieces. It is a rare thing. It doesn't happen a lot in chess, but sometimes you will find yourself in this position. If this game had played out this way with Black just tossing away these two rooks, he would be in a position where he can't move at all. He has no piece on the board that he can make a legal move with. And that is the definition of a stalemate. It's not a checkmate. It's a stalemate. Black is to move. He cannot move any of his pieces. He has no legal moves. The game can't go forward. And so that is counted as a draw. So rather than the score being 1-0 for White's win, which it was about to be, White had a mate sitting on the board, it ends up being half-half, half. it's a draw. And in tournament play, that would matter a lot. And this is just, the people online call this a swindle and a robbery because White had that uh, checkmate sitting there on the board, um, but Black saw this little plan to, to turn it into a draw. By the way, if we set those rooks back, one of them was on h2 and one was on g3, if it played out a little bit differently, you would still have a draw. Here's what might have happened. If... Uh, White plays kx h2, which remember, he has to, he has no other legal move, and black follows with rook g2 check. The white doesn't have to take that rook, which results in a stalemate, but here's what would happen. Uh, if he says, does uh, king h3, just to put the king on a safe square, hoping that he can, on his next move, get that mate he has, black just follows up with Rook g3, check. And then he doesn't want to take that rook, right? Because it's going to be a stalemate, which is a draw. White has a win on the board. He doesn't want a stalemate. So if he shuffles his king back down to h2, which aside from taking the rook is his only other legal move, uh, black again does rook g2, check. And if that repeats one more time, you also have a draw. Another way to get a draw is by repetition of moves. If you have the same position on the board three times in a row, that is a draw. So White realizes that if he takes the two rooks, it's a stalemate, which is a draw. And if he doesn't, if he tries to avoid taking this rook, it will be a, uh, a draw anyway by repetition of moves. There are other ways you can have a draw, perpetual check, 
or if you actually have a game, and I've never seen this happen, that goes 50 moves with no pawn advances or captures, I can't imagine that even happening, uh, that's another way to get a draw. Those two don't happen much, so I'm not going to emphasize them here. One way you can have a draw is by repetition of moves, which also is relatively rare, except for when players do it on purpose at advanced play, or a stalemate, which is also relatively rare. The more common, probably the number one way that draws happen, is if you're in an endgame scenario and you're equally matched and you're just not interested in playing this game out, you, you think, well, neither of us are going to make any big mistakes. I don't think I have any advantage. He doesn't think he has any advantage. This game isn't really going anywhere. You can offer your opponent a draw. You can say on your move, well, why don't we call this a draw? Would you like a draw? And if they agree to it, that's the most common way probably that a draw happens is an agreed upon draw, which also would be written half dash half. And in friendly games, like when I play students or I play with my, my children, we, we often will have a draw that's agreed upon where it's like, ah, uh, this game isn't really going anywhere. Maybe, it, it may be in a case where you both made blunders that you don't like, and it's not a beautiful game. It's just not a good looking game. It's not a game you're enjoying. You just say, let's call this a draw. Okay, it's a draw. Clear the board, set them up, and start a new one that you're going to enjoy. So now we've covered stalemate, draws in general, the different ways you can affect a draw, agreed upon, uh, repetition of moves, stalemate, um, 50 move games with no pawn advances or captures, and a perpetual check when it's just check after check. Um, but remember, I want you to keep in mind that draws are relatively uh, rare things like stalemates. The most common draw is either going to be when you have a repetition of moves that the players do on purpose to create a draw or where there's an agreed upon draw. And I want to reemphasize what I said earlier that if you're playing a friendly game, you should not be on the board with just a king and no other pieces or, or with almost no material against a well-armed opponent trying to uh, force a, a stalemate. Uh, that's not good manners. Instead, you would just resign and play a new game. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed this. We will see you next time at Chess Fest Academy. This lesson actually covers all the basics. It took us 11 lessons to get here, but now you have all the basics of the game, and we can start talking about openings and middle game and end game strategies, uh, looking for pins, forks, skewers, all the interesting tactics. If you stop here, that's a bad thing. What you want to do is go on and start learning a little bit of strategy, know a few basic openings. You, you need to move on from just how to move the pieces and what are the basic rules of the game. You need some strategy and some tactics to help you to become a better player. And we'll be doing that next time here on Chess Fest Academy. See you then.